there's just so many gold related juniors that are getting killed here at $2,500 gold. And part of the reason Andy is. John Sonic, what's going on? Hey, Doug, what's Andy? It's good to see you. Uh, I was texting back and forth with you and you were overseas uh, visiting clients and trying to get a pulse of things. You're a busy guy. What was the pulse on everything over there? Well, European investors are, I think, more of a watch and a watch than act group sometimes when it comes to mining. Not always, but um, I've spoken in London and Zurich in the last couple of years. And, and you know, I think you get kind of like, yeah, I'll think about it. That's a compelling idea, but they don't act right away. Um, so I think there's, there's more of a sense of urgency this year than I've seen in the last two years, which is positive. I can say from the U.S. clients I have, there's definitely like a, a sense that we've turned the corner in certain things like gold and uranium and, you know, silver is just frustrating and it, it continues to frustrate, but, um, that is an opportunity, right? Because silver is going to be along for the ride as you and I have talked about in the past. Um, and, and if you just look at points in, in history where we had the pandemic, right? It sold off, but bounced huge in 2020. Then February, 2022, the Russia invasion, it bounced huge in March and April. And so like, it does respond. It's just not responding as much as I think the average investor would like. So. Got it. Well, you're headlining some events and did you headline any events over there or? No, I was just seeing clients, but uh, this fall, we have a lot of speaking engagements. Um, probably it's any Beaver Creek, September 10th through the 13th in Colorado, if anyone wants to see me there. But then from there, I'm on to Stockholm to speak at that event. Then I'm on to um, my, my own event in October in Florida, where I'll be speaking October 20 through 22. Um, and then on to Zurich, London, Zurich, speaking at all three of those in November. So um, yeah, our event in Florida has been pretty cool. Um, there aren't too many U.S. investment conferences that are really centered around networking and one-on-one -on -one meetings. You know, Beaver Creek does a really good job of the one-on-one -on -one aspect, but it's four days long, right? So it gets to be like a marathon to me sometimes um, when you're at 8,900 feet uh, or whatever the alt altitude is. It gets to me at least on day one. But uh, it's just a fantastic conference. It's just a little long for me. So, so what we're doing is we're going to have a two-day conference. It's going to start October twentieth uh, with a dinner and a, and a formal uh, formal dinner and a, and a happy hour. And then on day two, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one day from like eight to four thirty, which is going to be just CEOs meeting with investors one-on-one -on -one in a quiet setting where they can ask questions. It's not just you know the, the company spewing information out over a forty page deck, it's going to be more interactive because that's what I'd like to achieve here at this conference, right? It's something where the client walks away saying, you know, I really learned a lot and now I can implement those ideas that I learned into a buy sell strategy, right? Like that's, that's what it's all about is, is, is not only coming away with knowledge for these conferences, but then actually implementing those ideas, which I don't find happens all the time. And then on day three, Andy, we're going to have speakers uh, from eight to one. And I've got some amazing speakers lined up. I've got Don Durrett from goldstockdata.com, who's been doing it, you know, gosh, 35, 40 years now in this sector. Um, he's Larry Leppard's uh, right-hand guy here in the States. And we also have uh, Stephen Miller, who I just secured last week, who's been doing it 50 years, started in 1974 in the Chicago CBOE and just knows so much about the broad market as well as our sector, right? So it's not just a conference that's going to be focused on commodities only. We're going to be talking about things like the broad market, the Fed, the BRICS, things that will affect, you know, other people, other parts of people's portfolio. Yeah, excellent. And by the way, for all of our listeners, I'll be there as well. So please, yeah. if you're attending, please grab me and say hello. So. Let's uh, talk about what's going on right now here. Um, the overall market's selling off. And um, we've said this before that September, August and September, really, but specifically September is typically a tough month for stocks. Here, here we, what are your expectations now going through the, uh, the rest of the month? And then we have the Fed meeting in a couple of weeks. So, yeah. Um, We've been saying on your show and every show since the summertime that I really thought that um, early September 
And since the September 10th debate has been secured, September 10th to be specific, we would start seeing some selling um, based on whatever happens in the debate, right? I mean, I don't think many of us had, if we were betting, uh, in, in, you know, that we, we would have seen a Trump Biden uh, situation. It was so one sided. Um, and I don't know that this one's going to be 100% one sided. I think it'll be, you know, Kamala Harris's first opportunity to really go up against her candidate, you know, her competitor, rather than just going to the DNC for a few days and, and talking. This is going to be, okay, what are your policies? How are you going to implement this? And let's see how she does. I am still of the, of the thinking, Andy, that if we get a Kamala Harris win, ultimately, that would be very, very bullish for, for gold and silver because it's just another unknown, right? It's like, uh, at least we've had Trump for four years. We kind of know what Trump's about. Trump's very transparent. He doesn't pull any punches. Uh, I think the markets like that more. Wall Street likes certainty, right? You know this from doing it as long as you have. Um, but... Uh, when you have an unknown like Harris Waltz, I mean, who, who knows what that combo looks like in the next four years. And so I think it's going to create a tremendous bid on gold and silver because you're combining that uncertainty with a lower rate environment, right? So, and let's face, let's face it, Trump being a real estate guy, don't you think he wants lower rates? I mean, of course. So I think we win either way as, as gold and silver investors, I really do. And that's why I encourage people on days like today, you brought up the, the sell-off. I mean, silver was down 4% at one point. You have to buy these dips in, in a bull market framework. If we were at 22 silver, I wouldn't be saying that. But anything above 26 silver, um, you're in a bull market right now. And you broke it out to that $30 magical level and broke that like butter. So now you just have to worry about getting back to 30 plus at some point. And I think you're going to get there within the next three to four months. And I just said this on Kitco over the weekend. Yeah. Okay. So where are you looking for value then? Is it just the usual suspects that you mentioned before? Are there any new players? And it's fine if there are the, the usual suspects, but where are you seeing really deep value here? Well, I think taking gold stocks and I'll just rattle off a few without going into too much detail. People will have my contact information in the show notes. So feel free to contact me if you want more information. Um, there's just so many gold related juniors that are getting killed here at $2,500 gold. And part of the reason Andy is that they're not producing, they are explorers in next gold, right? That used to be treasury metals. Um, that, that stock is, is, is so much better off than it was a few months ago when it was flying by itself with three million ounces in Canada. Now it's got Frank Justra's Fury group behind it. And Frank is, is, is a mighty hall of famer, right? Like, I mean, he's going to bring new investors into that stock over time. They have, uh, a reinvigorated marketing approach. Um, I, I think, you know, that that's something that we would look at with. Anything with 3 million ounces or more, we get really excited about, you know, um, I mentioned on Kitco, another one, Cartier Resources, uh, ECRFF, you know, same thing, two and a half to 3 million ounces, go, you know, two and a half going to 3 million, uh, in Canada, in a good jurisdiction run by another person that I, I have respect for. So, you know, Jeremy Wyeth runs next goal, Philippe Cloutier runs Cartier. Both of these guys have done it for years and years and years in they are shareholder friendly CEOs, meaning they don't have, they, they know how much work they put into both of their projects. They're not selling for pennies in the dollar. That's something Andy, that we have to be looking at as investors, right? Because that marathon gold transaction last November, I mentioned it once on your show before, but that was a real wake up call, even for someone like myself to saying, Hey, this was a newsletter favorite. How did this thing sell for pennies in the dollar? Like, that's not what we're in this sector for. We don't want, you know. Uh, a stock to decline immensely and then sell out for a 20 or 30% premium. It's 20 or 30% on a, on a very low base, right? It's not, it's not a premium unless you were just lucky enough to get it at that price. And then, you know, you make a small amount of money, but, um, I think doing the homework in the gold space right now with gold, where it is, makes a lot of sense. Um, and combining that with an, a, an approach to, to have some producers as, you know, uh, um, in your portfolio, right? And there's so many of those that we can get into at another time, but obviously 
like Newman, Agnico, Barrick. These are the kind of names you want to look at first that have the biggest, you know, um, market caps and also have, you know, decent margins. Got it. Are you looking at anything else in the natural resource sector besides um, the precious metal stocks, if you like? Yeah. So, um, I mean, copper is clearly not a precious metal. Um, it's it's a scarce metal. Um, and, and so we're, we're really, um, it's kind of a, a, a journey for, for copper investors, right? Over the last year and three quarters. I mean, well last said. year was, yeah. It was, it was not a good journey last year. Um, you know, when you have every analyst and their mother saying, you oh, know, what a great year it's going to be. And then it turns out that you're like negative one to 3% or whatever it was for the, for the entire year. You're like, okay, that didn't work. But then you look at, you know, I was at Beaver Creek speaking on copper last September. I kicked it off, uh, to a packed room. And I said, look, Goldman Sachs says 15,000 a metric ton literally less than two years from now. And we were trading at 7,000 something a metric ton. And I said, like, that's a double, like, even if it's a hundred percent on copper, like imagine what a free port or some of these copper producers do if copper was up a hundred percent. And so that's sort of like the same thing that we've been telling people about silver is like silver is at 27 or 28, but you know, imagine if it does get to $50, let's just even think about 35, right? Something like very attainable, I think. These companies don't go up 20% like the price of silver. They go up a lot more because of the leverage involved. And the same is true of copper stock. So, you know, we've been buying juniors again, just to name a few, like I mentioned on Kitco this weekend, uh, all the copper ATCUF. Um, we bought uh, Surge recently for the first time, SRGXF. Um, we bought... Um, Dev Gold, uh, geez, I guess in the spring in the T, like the teens are, are around 20, uh, and now it's retraced all the way back to there. So again, you know, we want to see the chart hold here, but NAUFF looks interesting because they have a lot of ounces in the ground, not only with copper, but with gold, right? And, um, uh, that's another way to play, uh, copper. And, uh, finally, like Denarius is one that I mentioned before, uh, DNRSF, you know, they're a polymetallic deposit. What's intriguing about them is that they're going to go into production here within six to 12 months at both of their locations, which would mean like, you know, let's call it worst case scenario, end of next year, they're in production. And for a, for a 32 cent stock, it's like, you know, the risk is, is there. Yes. But I mean, you're, you're de-risked in the sense that these are good jurisdictions with producers right around them. So they're not going to have to reinvent the wheel. Got it. Are you looking at any energy plays? And I specifically am thinking of uranium and why I bring up uranium. It was such a darling, um, the last, the, the last half of last year, if you would. Um, and then it just really, um, came back a little, I don't want to say it's completely, completely back down to earth, but it's come back a lot more if you would. And a lot of these stocks are attractive. Do you have any opinions on that? I think the uranium sector is very, the junior sector in particular is very undervalued right now. Um, if we were interviewing in January, I would have said the exact opposite. I would have said it was super overvalued right. um, because the spot price had gotten to, I think, 109 and Oops. it made an astronomical move in spot last year, as you know, without the stocks really responding. And then in January, February, the stocks finally responded, but then people bought that move up. And are now holding the bag, as we say in, in investing, right? And like, that's what we try as investors not to do is chase anything. Like if you loved it, chasing it in January or February, why wouldn't you buy here in August when no one wants the sector, right? Like that doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we have said on your show before, Forum FDCFF is drilling right now. They have a tremendous opportunity to, you know, impress investors here, I think between September and November when their assays come around, um, they're drilling in Canada in a really good jurisdiction, um, with a solid team, uh, Peninsula, PENMF is in Wyoming, you know, they're putting lids back into production. They've got the money they've got, they've had the news flow. If you look at July 31st, they're talking about all the metrics needed to get this thing back into production in the U S in a good jurisdiction this year. You know, like not three years from, um, if you look at URA, which is sort of like the ETF that I use for the larger cap or mid cap producers, right? That, that would include 
Camato, Next Gen, all those kind of names in one basket, right? Like I, like I do with gold at GDX. I can buy all those gold names in one ticket as opposed to buying, you know, 30 different holdings, right? And mm-hmm. so that's something that was down, I think, 5% today. It's like, you know, those are the kind of days if you're a uranium bull, you just got to buy these dips. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we play it. You know, we do the same kind of thing we do with gold. We'll buy the small stuff like Forum or Peninsula and we'll temper that with larger cap producers and use a barbell approach. Got it. So we have the Fed meeting in a couple of weeks here. And um, what do you think is going to happen? Obviously, the, the markets are betting on a cut here. But what do you think is how, the, how is the market going to react and respond to a Fed cut? And is, that our, is the move already is that part of the down move here just because the, the expectation or the thought was that they might be cutting more? It's going to be part of the sell-off. I think, um, I think the expectations of the broad market participants are way out in left field. It's like the <laughs> Fed is not going to have your back, you know, and this cycle, like it has in previous cycles, that's the $64,000 question. And yeah. I hope I'm wrong. Believe me, I am positioned for that you know, going the other way. However, I'm also positioned in stuff that I'm confident will do well over time, such as like a new month. I don't care at $51 if new month goes to 70 this year or next year, because I can clip a really nice coupon mm-hmm. and still see exponential growth for a large cap holding that is right. Like you know, 40% is a nice move on a large cap. Um, but no, I think, I think the Fed is showing a 61% probability as we speak of a 25 basis point cut, not the 50 that they were talking about in June, July, or at least the market was talking about in June, July when things were making all time highs. Right. So I think it's just part of this is, is the markets coming to the reality that the Fed is not going to be cutting rates as quickly as they would like. The real question here, Andy, is what Powell says on September 18th, right? Like what does he say in the press here to give us indication of what the direction of future cuts looks like got it yeah it should be uh it should be interesting it might be bloody from uh now until then i would say bloody in the overall overall market so john uh one more question again um your uh your event in um in october i will put everything in the show notes but just tell us again where is it at and how can people register and i'll put all the links in the show notes sure so you can register through our website, which is top shelf and then a hyphen and then partners.com. Just go to the homepage, click investor registration, fill out the form, and we'll let you know if you are going to get in for free or if you'd have to pay to attend. I mean, all these conferences, Andy, like Beaver Creek and Rick Rule Symposium, they all have a fee attached to them. But for accredited investors and or yeah. people that are actually buying lightning stocks, you know, we're, we're waiving the fee so that they can come for free. Um, and it's going to be at the Four Seasons in Fort Lauderdale, right on the beachfront. It's a beautiful hotel. It's been around for about two years. It's the only five diamond resort in the metro area. So there's a ton of things to do. And, you know, we're, we're encouraging both companies and investors to bring their significant other or their family and have a good time while they're there. All right. Excellent. Well, John, always a pleasure. Um, look forward to having you on again, really again soon. Thanks, Andy. All right, have a good one.